Oh man, do I look as exhausted as I feel? Well, as promised, the results for the 8700K overclocking are in, and I don't wanna waste any more time. Let's jump in. Yo, I'm Brian P. You're watching Bad Seat Tech and what's really good. So after a couple days of tweaking and dialing in this overclock, running some benchmarks, I finally got some numbers. Now, first things first, let's just get rid of the elephant in the room. I was not able to achieve five gigahertz on air with this sample. At anything north of like 1.32 volts, the temperatures just got out of hand quickly. To frame this up, I am using the Gigabyte RS Gaming 5 motherboard, not the 7 for reasons I'll get into in an upcoming review of that board. I'm also using the Be Quiet Dark Rock Pro 3 air cooler, which for the record is my favorite cooler for its blended performance and silence. The thing is dead ass quiet. I could have used the Cryo Rig R1 Ultimate here. It tends to yield on average about two degrees cooler across the board than the Be Quiet, but it comes at a great expense of noise. So the Be Quiet Dark Rock Pro 3 stays. The other components of this test bed are the GTX 1080 Ti Founders Edition running at stock clocks and what has quickly become the most embarrassing aspect of my test bench. That is 16 gig of Corsair Vengeance DDR4 RAM, and that is using an XMP profile to clock that to 2666. Yeah, I know, it's time for an upgrade. It's also worth noting that I did not disable a whole bunch of stuff to get these overclock benchmarks. I wanted to keep a real world, real use scenario, so I kept the system pretty much exactly where it was when I ran the numbers for the stock clock. So that means stuff like Q software, Razer Synapse, SteelSeries software, all that stuff is still there. I didn't disable anything. So it's still got the same system overhead as it normally would. Now second, what I'm not gonna do is walk you through the UEFI and the process of how I got this overclock. Sorry Gamba, I know I said I'd hook you up buddy, but the fact of the matter is Gigabyte has already released a very detailed, thorough guide out there on how to overclock this board. And in case that's not enough for you, there's another YouTuber out there by the name of Dino. I'm pretty sure this guy works for Gigabyte as well, but he expounds on some of this stuff and it's really important that you read the guide and watch the video both if you have this board and you're trying to nail your overclock because he actually goes through and disables some stuff in his video that isn't mentioned in the guide and he clears up a couple points that are fuzzy. So I'll leave links for both in the description below. So what I was able to achieve on this setup is a 4.9 gigahertz stable at 1.3 volts in Prime 95 with small FFT testing. Now this saw temps in the mid 80s. It's worth noting that any other benchmark I did today, including the Adobe stuff, only temped out at like 76. Now 5.0 was not stable even at 1.33 volts and the temperature spiked hard. So anything north of that, I just wasn't really comfortable. So I'll have to revisit the five when we get it on some water or we delid the chip. So onto the benchmarks. So kicking it off with Firestrike Ultra and DX11. Now the score in stock was 6804 and moving up to the overclock at 6848. So not a lot of action there. Reason being is that the graphic score is damn near identical. The physics score is where you're gonna see all the action here with the stock yielding an 18,768 and the overclock yielding a physics score of 21,000. 312, so not a bad jump to the physics. And we see that same trend continue with Time Spy and DX12. The score to beat with stock is a 9345. Overclock came in at a 9501. So it made a bigger difference to the overall score. The graphics were similar, maybe degraded even just a little bit on the 4.9. And uh, the CPU, again, is where we see the action with the overclock bringing an 8641 versus a stock of 7740. With the division, well, the division didn't really seem to care for the overclock so much. As you can see, we have slightly degraded performance on the overclock there. You kind of have to take this with a grain of salt. Division obviously being GPU bound. In the benchmarks, I saw the GPU getting hit for like 96%. The CPU barely even breaking a sweat at 35%. So I don't think these results are going to be indicative of what we're going to see with the other titles. Oh boy, Grand Theft Auto, where the results are just quite literally off the charts. I mean... We saw that it was it was really pushing it when we ran the 6700K against the 8700K, but as we get into the overclock results, it's just ridiculous. Now, these settings, just so we're clear, were run at 1080p and 1440p respectively. All of the settings that could possibly be set to high were set to high with minimal anti-aliasing and everything in the advanced settings not even active, like set to absolute low. So obviously when you're running a rig of this stature with this chip and this graphics card, we have a lot of room for overhead. Nonetheless, we did see some improvements here. At 1080p, we saw like about a 12 frame per second jump. And at 1440p, we saw almost 10 frames a second out of the overclock. I'll take it. All right, so with Tomb Raider at high settings again, with a rig this caliber, you've got some massive overhead here. We could definitely, definitely pump the details up. Running high settings, DirectX 11. When you're looking at 1080p, 
This overclock absolutely smokes. Look at that, 172.8 versus 155.2 running stock. As we get into 1440p, again, that gap closes. And uh, as my dude Adam A was quick to point out, this game becomes GPU bound as you get up around this resolution. So I would expect similar results if we were looking at 4K, but wow, the 1080p results, just astounding. Ashes of the Singularity, Escalation, high settings, DirectX 12, 1080p, that overclock's gonna net you about eight FPS difference. Looking at 121.6 for 4.9 versus the stock 113.8. Moving up to 1440p, you see about a 5 FPS difference, 117.5 versus 112.5 on the stock. And bear in mind, if you're running these benchmarks for yourself, I am using the average frames per second, not the CPU on these tests. Ooh, man, Breath of the Wild, Simu 1.11.0. This took a tremendous amount of discipline for me to be able to bring this to you because Simu's seen an update and we've seen some DLC for Breath of the Wild, but I left things exactly as they were for testing purposes and I definitely got what I was looking for. At 1080p, 49.3 versus a 42.8. 49.3 in one of the busiest areas of the game. That means if you're playing this at 1080p, you're gonna pretty much be looking at 60 FPS like 80% of the time, which is a phenomenal way to play this title, especially at a higher resolution than the Switch or the Wii U are able to provide. And we see some pretty decent gains at 1440p as well, 47.9 with the overclock. So again, gonna be seeing really, really good performance for this game all throughout. And on to my two favorite tests of the bunch, the Adobe Premiere Pro H.264 4K render. This is a five minute complex timeline. At stock, we were able to knock this thing out in seven minutes 29 seconds more or less. The overclock took that down to six minutes and 46 seconds. So it's 45 seconds, it's 45 seconds. But on a small scale like that, that's a decent amount of gains. I'll take that. For Adobe Media Encoder, we took 2.75 gig. Those are those 10 files of H.264 4K. We're gonna transcode those to Cineform 10-bit 4K files. Stock knocked it out at three minutes and 54 seconds. Stepping up to the overclock, we knocked it out in three minutes, 33. So 20 seconds, but end of the day, gains are gains, and free performance, I'll take that any day of the week. So there it is. All in all, I'm pretty happy with the results, but I feel like I'm not gonna be fully satisfied until I delid this thing and eventually get it on a custom loop. Now, one important note here, if you're new to this or overclocking makes you nervous or the UEFI is just too much for you to handle, Gigabyte does actually have a surprisingly good auto overclock option. And for this chip in particular, you just Go down to the line that says CPU upgrade, and you can select a 5.0 overclock, run it, test it. If it doesn't work, bump it down to 4.9 and down to 4.8. 4.8 is the lowest you can go with the auto option. Now, in my case, 4.8 stable was all I was able to get with the auto option. And to put that in some context, in TimeSpy, it pulled like a 9345 instead of the 9501 I was able to achieve with a manual 4.9 overclock. So I guess the good news is you guys are getting a D-Lid video out of this thing because I'm dying to know what it looks like when I pop the top, apply some liquid metal, run it through the same battery of benchmarks and see if I can eke out an even higher overclock. And big shout out to my boy Keith May for making that all possible. He shipped me out a D-Lid kit today and I am super stoked to get that underway. And that's gonna do it for this time. I'm Brian P. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button, hit that sub button. And until next time, stay up.